drugs and surgery don't cut it. So what I do is my job is to vet out, Brock, the very best things there are in this world that mm -hmm. insurance companies don't cover, that if you have the money, are there for you. Mm -hmm. And the regenerative biologic world right now is taking off. We're learning every three, four months, we're, we're doubling our knowledge. So if you go on Google and you type in some of the things we're gonna talk about today on how we can regenerate tissue, mm -hmm. um, you're not gonna find it. Welcome to the Zero Quit Podcast, where I bring you candid conversations with elite athletes, entrepreneurs, specialists, and other creatives. I'm your host, Brock Covington, and through these dialogues, you will hear powerful stories and practical advice that will help you live a more active and intentional life. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode. Today, I have on Dr. Jeff Donatello. Jeff has over 25 years of clinical practice experience utilizing regenerative medicine, functional medicine, as well as stem cell therapy. He's the co-founder of the Center for Wellbeing, which he also runs with his wife, Kelly. How are you doing, man? Hey, Brock. I'm doing great. How are you? Over in Colorado. New Hampshire uh, to Colorado. I know. That's, well, that's the beauty of the remote podcast is I can do it everywhere. I love the in-person because I think it just flows a little more naturally. I feel like I get to know the person a little deeper, but the remote is awesome because we can just connect from different, you know, almost polar opposites of the, uh, the country. So it's, it's good to connect that way. Yeah, man. Part two, we'll fly. We'll fly to each other. We'll that's, get like an exotic location. How's that's that? right. That'll be easier than the uh, the technical difficulties we've been <laughs> we've been having so far. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one one thing I'll kick off with is just what is that experience? Just because I, I I've experienced it as well of owning a business with your wife. Because I owned a strength training facility for two years with my wife, and I've I've spoken to some other. Um, people that either currently own a business with their spouse or used to. And uh, I think there's a lot of, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy because it's, there's so much beauty with opening a business with someone, you know, you trust and you love and you're passionate with, you can see every day and it's, it's great. Um, but at the same time, trying to define personal space and, and not, you know, <laughs> getting frustrated because you're seeing each other nonstop, right? You're at, you yeah. see each other before work, at work, home. So uh, what is that experience like with you or how do you guys balance it? You know, rule number one, happy life, happy wife. We've all heard yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. right? <laughs> and uh, we have to set boundaries here. About four, during COVID, we had a post-COVID shift where uh -huh. we developed the metabolic reset weight loss program to add to our stem cell therapies. And we went from four employees to almost 30 right now. So that can be all-encompassing. And um, it's very easy for us to go. We're like, uh, we're, we're kind of like... One one day we're all about work and the next day we're all about play, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, we're, we're all over the place with it. But I do know this is that we really try to give each other morning time um, in the morning so that we can go off and do our own thing and try to, you yeah. know, whether it's work out or, or meditate or take the dog on the beach. We try to do individual things in the morning and then we're at work all day, work with separate people for the most part. Yeah. And then we come back at the end of the day and we wrap things up and um, – we don't carry it into the evening, yeah. Uh, so it's been working out pretty well. We're about eight years into our relationship, five, six years married. So yeah. so far, so good. Yeah. So you, you you get a good balance. You know what works, what doesn't. That makes sense. Another, We're trying. Yeah. Another interesting thing about you, before we dig into all, all the uh, the medical stuff, is uh, you're a big triathlon guy. So I think you've done something like 110 triathlons. Is that right? Yeah, you know, at age 30, I started doing it. My my former wife and I were really big into that. We owned two races. We owned a, a race that got small race of the year, um, uh -huh. USAT, called Pumpkin Man. It was a half Ironman. And I also owned Sea to Summit. Um, and it was kind of our life. We did, you know, 10, 11, 12 races, one Ironman a year, a lot of sprint tries. Um, all our social group was into that. So mm -hmm. it, um, and then. Uh, about six or seven years ago, I stopped. I need to go to the next level um, with what I was doing personally. Yeah. And uh, it's been 30 pounds more, right? I'm 30 pounds heavier than I went when I raced. Yeah. Um, I was emaciated when I raced. Um, now I'm more healthy. Um, but I am doing a, a sprint try this summer. Have you ever heard of a misoji? The Japanese yeah. have a word yeah. called misoji. I You've have. heard of that? Yeah. So for those who are listening that don't know, a misoji is one event, something you do during the year that you plan out that you have a 50% chance of failing to challenge you. So my triathlon, the summer, the sprint try is, um, it's not about finishing. It's about placing in my age group, which is probably not going to happen because these guys are fast. I'm 54 <laughs> now. And it seems like people have gotten faster than well, they used to. For some reason, I feel like endurance sports is like the one type of athletics to where the better athletes are kind of in their like late thirties or even like forties and fifties, like, especially with like ultra running, some of the better athletes 
are you know in those later age groups so it is like you mentioned they're still kicking ass it's like fine wine and yeah. you know going back the great thing is i'm now in a regenerative world where we help those athletes but the um, the the mount washington bike race is a big international bike race and i remember two or three years ago it was won by a 52 year old guy mm -hmm. so i mean that's a very competitive race so yeah we can you know which leads us into longevity and how do we stay healthy and and that's my cup of tea Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, as, as long as you can, you can diminish your physical, chemical and, and emotional stressors, yeah. that's how you do it as you get older. So we can go whatever direction you want and just let me well, know. Well, you know what? I think that's a good, uh, jumping point that we can start off right there talking about longevity and athletics and just general health for all populations too. One thing that I, I noticed when I was kind of reviewing what you, what you do with the center for wellbeing is it's kind of alternate options, alternate medicine for people, because I think there is that problem that I've seen with, uh, with my personal training clients, with family members, um, with variety of people that they're kind of rushed to surgery whenever they injure a hip, a shoulder, a knee, their back, whatever. It's kind of like, well, let's fuse the discs or let's do a knee replacement or hip replacement. And I, I like that you kind of go about it a different approach and you're trying to say, okay, well, what, what can we do besides that? Because sometimes those can work either in the short term, but they have some consequences or they need more work done later on. And it's kind of like once you replace that knee, you, know, you don't have the same knee anymore. So I guess what is your uh, approach with that? What, what do you think is the problem with that rush to surgery? Yeah, you know, we've had over 400 people with scheduled knee or hip replacement surgeries that they didn't have to do it, over 400. Mm -hmm. So I look at this thing called the law of wisdom, right? Everything is, in this world is thrown at us, good, bad, ugly. And the law of wisdom basically states, what, what does it mean to you? How, what can you learn from it? And one thing we learned from COVID is that this country is a highly sick and inflamed country. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so our COVID shift was to work with inflammation um, to get people to be more healthy through losing weight, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why we have our metabolic weight loss program. But a lot of that inflammation creates joint dysfunction. So in, I know you're an ultra endurance athlete. You do a lot of long distance running. Nature and nurture come into play. So it's pretty much next to impossible to not to go through 20, 30 years of endurance sports and not hit my age, 50, 55, getting into 60, mm -hmm. where you lift your shoulder above your head and it starts killing you. You wake yeah. up in the morning, your knees and hips are sore. So that's early degenerative change. That's, we, I look at it as rust, right? Mm -hmm. If you're talking to a third, fourth, fifth, sixth grader, as you get older, your grandfather's rusty, right? Well, in the past, we couldn't do much about it because you fall the world, the United States is it's basically our medicine, at least from a chronic, the C word, chronicity, mm -hmm. is controlled by insurance industry, the insurance industry and pharmaceutical industry. So you go to your doctor and they want to put you on a drug. They, they mean well. But yeah. if you have an acute episode, they mean right? profit too, though, right? <laughs> it's 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 about it's a business. Mine's a yeah. business too, right? Yeah, of course. But they mean well, but drugs and surgery don't cut it. So what I do is my job is to vet out, Brock, the very best things there are in this world that mm -hmm. insurance companies don't cover. That if you have the money, are there for you. Mm -hmm. And the regenerative biologic world right now is taking off. We're learning every three four months. We're we're doubling our knowledge. So if you go on Google and you type in some of the things we're going to talk about today on how we can regenerate tissue, mm -hmm. um, you're not going to find it. And it's my job to, to nail down the best scientists that are doing this work. And we've had over 2,000 patients go through regenerative therapies in our office. Um, and we've had over 3,000 people go through our metabolic weight loss program. So while I don't have all the answers and things are constantly changing, we have a lot of the answers that you're not going to be able to find on Dr. Google yeah. just because we have, you know, we have so many people we work with. So what are some of those common solutions? I'm sure it's always the classic, you know, well, it depends from client or patient to patient, injury to injury. Um, but what, what are some of those common uh, strategies or treatment options that you're kind of recommending and going through with? Um, you know, the probably most popular one that people have heard of a lot is stem cell therapy. But one, I think it's one of those terms that people kind of throw out there. They don't really understand how it works. And then two, I feel like despite it being known for a while, it's not common practice. I feel like there might be like lingering controversy that I'm not really sure what it is with that. Um, so I just threw a lot at you, but however you want to dissect that. Yeah, well, this is what it comes down to. We don't use stem cells in the U.S. Okay, okay. we use biologics with the stem cells secrete for the most part, at least from donors. Now, you yeah. can from yourself. If you, if you take the stem cells out of yourself, 
That's called an autologous technique. That's kind of becoming old school. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually now an allogeneic technique. So what happens is we want to find a healthy baby, healthy mom, where the mom has raised her hand and a cord bank has connected with them in a hospital mm -hmm. and they have a C-section birth coming up. All right. So if you've ever been around someone who's been pregnant, you know, they have a big belly. That's amniotic fluid that's protecting mm -hmm. that baby. That amniotic fluid is nature's way of protecting the baby, not only from falling, right, from mechanical stress, but from the mom's diseases. Mm -hmm. So here's the whole trick. What we use is a purified amniotic fluid product where our scientists takes that amniotic fluid and cleans it up. It's tested by a third party. And what we do is we pull out these little things called micro vesicles, okay? Mm -hmm. what a micro vesicle, look at it, is a little teeny bubble. 250 billion of little teeny bubbles, exactly what you have in you, that go after inflammation. And there's messenger RNA, micro RNA, and protein in this mix, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is what has kept us safe for 80,000 generations, Brock. All right, two million years we've been evolving with this fluid around us or, or the baby wouldn't survive. Mm -hmm. So we take it out, and this is the amazing part. When we inject it back in, it goes after the inflammation. It's exactly what you have in you. There's no DNA. There's not live product. There's not a mm -hmm. cellular product. It's what that cellular product secretes. But it goes after inflammation. So if you hurt your shoulder, your neck, your back, your ankles, whatever that is, and you're three months in, six months in, you're going to the chiropractor, acupuncturist, PT, mm -hmm. and that pain is still there. You now have a chronic issue. So we would inject under ultrasound guidance if you fall into the right categories. Um, mm -hmm. And that's basically meaning you're not super sick, right, with all sorts of comorbidities. But we would inject into um, that joint up to a trillion of these little bubbles mm -hmm. that go to town. And think of inflammation, especially arthritis, right? Arthritis, I always look at arthritis like these little guys, they're shining a flashlight. Hey, immune system, come here, mm -hmm. okay? So if we put all this into you, um, what we get is about a 90% of our, 90% of our people get 60 to 90% better in mm -hmm. six to tw in about six months. Um, many people get changed right off the bat. I, 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 my father-in-law, I love telling this story for two years. I said, you gotta come see us. And he could barely walk. And he walked in and walked out pain-free which yeah. is about 15%. But most of the time, you know, we work with a lot of athletes, a lot of hikers, a lot of skiers. Um, they're happy with what we do. And um, it just, you know, you've got to take care of your body afterwards. Yeah. In order so, to heal. so it sounds like it's, it's a, instead of trying to come up with our own artificial solution inflammation, we take something that our body, uh, or at least that's available to a, a pregnant woman that's already secreting and, and leverage that as kind of like a biological solution. I guess, is that where some of the uh, issue with people with using stem cells in the country is because of that kind of process? Because is it, is that fluid pulled while the woman is still pregnant or is it post-pregnancy or like what, what's the kind of timeline with that? And is that where some of the controversy uh, lingers with that? Yeah, good, good question. The controversy comes from the Bush administration okay. um, in the 80s because they were using uh, aborted fetuses. That's what I thought. Way back when. Yeah. Okay. And when people think aborted fetuses, they think oh, a, a, a seventh term, a late term baby, they kill yeah. it. They take all the, it's not that. It's basically artificial, artificially creating life and then using that life, stopping it and use, and pulling the stem cells out of it, mm -hmm. which is unethical. It's immoral in many ways, especially mm -hmm. to the religious right. And it's illegal. So that doesn't happen. Um, this, is, this is a biological uh, product that is thrown in the trash, mm -hmm. right? It's actually thrown away. And, and one, um, in, one amount of amniotic fluid taken out, aspirated, um, is, it's basically the same as treating 200 knees so it's amazing how much we can get out of one healthy mom, healthy baby to help a lot of people. So is it uh, we're just kind of as the as the woman's being taken care of after giving birth? Yes. Okay, that's yeah. what I figured. So okay. no, so nothing's happening. It's not like the baby's love in the water in there. They drain <laughs> they the pool, it all and, out. It, yeah. and it's like ah, no. It doesn't. Yeah. Well, that that's what I figured. It was like the lingering confusion because sometimes things can get stigmatized by you mentioned bad administration or or bad science, unethical science in the past, and then as things kind of grow and evolve and and get de more developed, um, some of those interpretations and perceptions still like linger in the public. So that 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 definitely clears that up. So transitioning beyond stem cell therapy, because you, you explained very well how that works and how beneficial it is. Um, what are some other methods that you're 
recommending often uh, to people that have, you know, instead of like a knee surgery or knee replacement, hip replacement, uh, you know, what are some other options? Well, you know, what's great about what we do that I don't think many people do is that we look at food as a um, instigator of pain. All right. Let yeah. me tell you a quick story. I had a lady that was 310 pounds come in a few years ago. This opened my eyes. I mean, my background's in chiropractic. I retired that license seven or eight years ago, mm -hmm. but I'm also certified in functional medicine and clinical nutrition. I've worked with all sorts of patients. This lady walked in. We had her, unfortunately, walk to the second floor of our office here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and she was in agony. Brock, she could barely walk. And I asked her what her pain level was. It was a 9 out of 10 scale. She started our metabolic program, which is basically a lot of testing. We can talk about that. But mm -hmm. eating real food, getting your inflammatory markers down quickly. Within one week, I saw the lady. She was about 10 pounds lighter, which is pretty normal. But she was walking almost normally. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, how are your knees? She goes, they're like 80% better. So if you're sitting here and you're listening to this and you have pain, know that quite frequently that pain is derived from food you eat yeah. and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a chemical stressor and which is why part of our metabolic program, we can talk about the, the functional medicine testing that we do, mm -hmm. the blood test, the hormone test, the food sensitivity tests are everything because many people will have gluten, dairy, soy, egg, whatever that is, they'll react to the proteins mm -hmm. and that'll cause, cause an inflammatory explosion, not just in their gut, but in their joints. And they don't even tie they don't even put two and two together. Yeah. Um, I know that if I have ice cream, my thumb hurts that I destroyed mountain biking. It inflames. I can yeah. tell, right? So that's how it works. Just uh, know that food causes joint pain. Yeah. Well, that, that was one big question I wanted to ask was all centered around inflammation because I think it's it's a really important issue is people's uh, inflammatory response to the foods that they're eating and, and diets a whole you know, own epidemic that's going on in this country. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's just bad actors that also want to take advantage of people and kind of promote, you know, I don't know, center supplements or special diets around anti-inflammatory diets and so forth. So, you know, naturally you get people that are kind of defensive, uh, yeah, defensive against things like that as well. So I guess you, you kind of explained how important inflammation is with the body. But I guess, what is going on with just that inflammation? Is there certain inflammation? Obviously, we do want some level of that blood flow recruitment and then inflammation. But I, I guess, what is what what are what do good levels look like? What do bad levels look like? What are some markers to look out for? You know, that's, a, that's a good question that no one ever asked me. And I love answering this question because there's, there's, you do a trail run, right? Yeah. And you're sore the next day. That's an acute inflammatory response. We have all these chemicals, exactly. prostaglandins and things like that that go to the joint. And the whole idea is to, is to calmly get that inflammation out slowly mm -hmm. um, because sometimes the inflammation can cause more damage than the original action. It's called the reperfusion injury, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why you want to be very careful, rest in between activity. Um, when we're talking cr a chronic inflammatory state, let's say you, you, have, you react to the gliadin protein in gluten. Um, or casein in dairy. That's going to cause a systemic effect of all these uh, cytokines. Uh, interleukin, we could talk big long words, interleukin yeah. 6, interleukin yeah. 8, tumor necrosis factor, all these things that, that basically tell your brain, no, we have a problem here. Mm -hmm. And those are, if, you, if you have belly fat over time, um, that's going to secrete uh, a, a interleukin, basically a cytokine, interleukin 6, that during COVID caused a... a, a uh, inflammatory storm in people and it killed a lot of people. So belly fat is pro-inflammatory and it makes everything else worse. So ultimately if you, the, the moral of the story is how do you know, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is where we want to do blood tests and the blood tests that your doctor gives you typically that insurance companies cover called a CBC is not going to look for the right things. So mm -hmm. if we want to, I'm not sure if you understand the difference between lab normal and functional normal, do you know the difference between the no, two? explain it to me. Uh, really important. So your doctor is looking at lab normals. Now who goes to labs, Brock? Sick people, right? Mm -hmm. So those normals are gonna be really wide. And we wanna look at optimal levels. This is functional medicine. We wanna take those numbers and nail them down, really, and narrow them down. So we do five pages of blood work that can all be done virtually. And it, what it does is, and this is, you can get this blood work around the country in different programs. The problem is then what, right? Mm -hmm. So we tie it all together. So our nurse practitioners are trained to look at it, put all those numbers in functional norms, right? So as far as your original question about inflammation, 
We want to see things like C-reactive protein and homocysteine and fibrinogen and insulin and hemoglobin A1C. We want all those markers to be normal. If, if too many of them are too high, your, L, your LDLs, right, your mm-hmm. cholesterols, it's, a, it's an art to look at this blood work. If too many of them are high, then there's different protocols that we do back to supplementation, um, excipient-free supplements. Now, I just wrote a word, excipients. An excipient is a binder, filler, glue, dye, color that makes money for the people that are making the product. So we use nutraceutical-grade supplementation that you have to be a doctor's office to carry, and it's something that um, needs to be prescribed specific for that blood deficiency. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So that's how we get people healthy. So we get them on real food that they shop in the grocery store. We have health coaches. We have 10 of them that guide them through that process. We do the blood work. Now, here's a second set. We want to do – the second test is a, a 24-hour cortisol rhythm test. So mm-hmm. how stressed are you? If you're sitting there in your car listening to this, I want to ask you. Physical, chemical, and emotional stress, right? Everybody has it. It's called life. Mm -hmm. But if you do an ultra marathon and you run 100 miles and you're beat the crap, right? Can I say crap on your podcast? Sorry. Yeah, Yeah, say anywhere. Anywhere. (laughs) All right. You beat the hell. That's even worse. So, and you keep doing it time after time after time. That's going to lower your testosterone. You're going to, your your inflammatory marker is going to be through the roof. Mm -hmm. That's a physical stressor, right? Um, that's going to cause you over time to be sick. We need to read those things. Just like emotional stressors, mm-hmm. um, if, you, if your girlfriend or wife just dumped you for another guy, right, or mm-hmm. vice versa. If your kid um, got fired or kicked out of school, if your boss hates you, those are emotional stressors. Your cortisol is going to be elevated yeah. way more at different times during the day. We want to be able to read that because your cortisol rhythm is something that should be, as a healthy human being, it should be nice and high in the morning and low at night so you get regenerative sleep. So mm-hmm. blood work, 24-hour cortisol test, and we also want to do, for sure, uh, we want to look at people's um, food sensitivity markers. Yeah. We want to know if you react to proteins. We have 95 foods that we look at, um, and then we can stay away from that. So as you can see, there's a lot to unpack here, yeah. but if you there's lots of different testing you can do. We find that these three tests are a really good place to start. Yeah. Well, before we dig into it, because you've referenced it a good number of times, it's something I want to get into is the metabolic um, reset program and all, all that you do with there and people's diet is uh, you reference two things that probably coincide within the same answer, but is the idea of, you know, what strategies do you go about besides food or do you recommend for reducing inflammation? Because like one thing that I do, uh, I, I try and do it pretty frequently. Sometimes I get lazier than others, especially with the winter is uh, ice baths, right? Are great for reducing inflammation. Um, yeah. And then another another uh, question would be so reducing inflammation, and then the other one is you know you talk about we have stress of all kinds, you know physical stress, emotional stress, all of those factors. And one thing that I think people forget is uh, you know watching Netflix or scrolling on Instagram, whatever at night, isn't a relaxing behavior. Your mind is still getting stimulated right by that that stimulus um, on the screen. Um, so what are some methods for that downregulation for reducing you know that stress and trying to uh, yeah, come back to homeostasis. So inflammation, stress, how do we, how do we come up with an answer for this? Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone's different. The, the, the average person's not going to do an ice bath, right? Yeah. But the average person can go out and walk, yeah. right? They can go 20 to 40 minutes. And that's if I didn't, if I didn't exercise or, or be active after this, I'm going to walk for an hour. I live a mile from the ocean. For mm-hmm. me, that's the same as sitting there for 20 minutes in a meditative state. Yeah. So I think we have to look at everybody, every personality as an individual. Right? There's not one thing that's across the board for everyone. But to give your listeners some type of idea, um, you know, what we do is uh, the first thing we want to do is, is stabilize insulin with food because we feel that it, we got to get that fat off you. Everything mm-hmm. is secondary if that fat's on you because I remember I talked about that inflammation. Yeah. But then afterwards, it's, it's doing a good case history, um, a good health coach. Uh, all ours are certified. Um, they all want to make sure that they understand that patient and where they're coming from because – the emotional stressors for people, um, not just looking at your phone on TikTok, but it can be a million things. Uh, if you're not sleeping well, if you're not getting regenerative sleep, you're going to be inflamed, period, mm-hmm. the end, just that alone. So, you know, we want to make sure that like sleep habits is a whole discussion we have for people. Um, you know, is your room dark, right? Pitch black, right? Oh, cool. Do you go to so bed? Forth. Yeah, cool yeah. room is super important. Um, pitch black, cold. I'm not cold, 68 to 70 degrees I like to see. 
yeah. sleeping. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, you don't have a pet that's waking you up. Um, we want to definitely make sure you go to bed within a half an hour and get up without an alarm clock within a half an hour. So I think that for us, sleep is a gigantic part to, to keeping that, that total inflammatory load down. We have, we have uh, 90 days with people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go to your doctor and they say, go see a nutritionist. They, you're, you have seven minutes with that person. Yeah. Uh, we have these, the people pay to spend 90 days with our program and then they can go on longer if they like. But it, it's really, a, our, in, our health coaches are detectives first. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Well, let's dig into it. So what is, what is the metabolic program that you guys have? How is it different? Uh, and, and yeah, what is your approach, uh, that is unique? Yeah. So I hate diets. Right? Yeah. And we don't count calories. I hate it. Um, we want to use real food. I, I despise programs where the ultimate goal is to sell you prepackaged meals long term. I we want to teach yeah. you how to eat real right, how to eat real food. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we have um, basically a 60 day program where they're reducing their their fat. How do mm -hmm. they do that? It's all about optimizing their health through stabilizing insulin levels. Okay? So low glycemic index food, high protein. We've really yeah. taken a lot of the good stuff from a lot of diets that work. Um, and I don't have all the answers because not everybody responds the same way. But I know that what I'm describing here, if we can keep people's insulin levels really super stable mm -hmm. and not have them fluctuate, again, through physical, chemical, and emotional stressors, um, and we have people, um, we have them fast for 16 hours. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. So a little um, bit of we, intermittent fasting as well. We do that, and I'm not yeah. a proponent of that long term. I don't think that's uh, we're maybe for some people. Um, yeah. But what we here's a great thing: we try to teach people that it's okay to be hungry, that hunger pains yeah. really. Someone once said that's that's your visceral fat, your organ fat melting away when you have <laughs> hunger pains, right? Yeah. Um, here's what happens in the U.S. Ready? Now, how old are you, Brock? You're younger than me a little bit. Twenty-three. All right. Double your years and add six. That's me, right? So right. in the seventies and eighties, we would wake up, and my mom would have the 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 I don't know pastry puffs there for me, whatever that junky breakfast was, oh, yeah. breakfast cereal uh -huh. at seven. Okay, now anyone who's over 40, 50, maybe even younger knows this. At seven o'clock, we had our breakfast off the school, ten fifteen snack. Couldn't get hungry. Mm -hmm. Don't want to feel those hunger pains. We don't want that. Lunch, sandwich, bread, junk, whatever. 2.15, 2.30, I'd come home, snack. 5.30, dinner, cookies and ice cream before I went to Sounds bed. Sounds like the good American diet. What's wrong with that? <laughs> yes, it's called the sad American diet, right? Yeah. The standard American diet, which is, it was, oh, in the 70s, it was all right, right? Because I was out, I was, I was outdoors all the yeah. time, right? Yeah. Moving, three sport athletes, just nonstop. Um, nowadays, what's happened is everybody slows down. Mm -hmm. And but more importantly, they've never been taught what it's like to be hungry. So yeah. if you want to lose weight, have some hunger pains before you go to bed. That's super important. Our last meal is at six o'clock. Um, we try to stick with it for the first 60 days. They will, um, you know, around 10, 11, 12, they'll eat, but they're going to have a high protein meal. We don't want to weigh or measure or count calories. We want it. To, we want it to be real school. So you take their palm and that's going to be your protein. If you're a big guy, it'll be a bigger, bigger amount of protein, right? Um, it's super important to stick with it. People lose weight like crazy. A big myth is if you lose weight quick, it's, it's dangerous. And I think that's because in the past, if people had cancer, you'd see them lose weight and then die. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can do is lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight. Yeah. It's very stressful. The yo -yo. But we have – our record is 19 pounds in six days one guy lost. It's a lot of water mm -hmm. weight, right? Yeah, of course. But the average yeah. person is going to lose – the average male is going to lose around 14 to 16 pounds in two weeks. Yeah. And the average woman around 12. Well, what I think you do that uh, – although you don't pinpoint and it doesn't sound like you personalize a certain calorie count or macronutrient count, but what I do think you solve for – and it, it makes it simpler for people is the fact that just eating, swapping in healthy foods – will automatically make you eat less a lot of times and be more satiated. You know, if you go from a bag of Tostitos, which is going to maybe be, you know, if you eat a, a, a heaping serving, two, 300 calories, but then you swap that up for a big bowl of strawberries, that's probably going to fill you up more and only be like 80 calories. Big difference, right? So, yeah, and people don't know that, that you're, you're right on. Fruits and veggies, they just don't eat them. So we want to mm -hmm. make sure that people are introduced to new types of food and how do, how do you respond to that food individually? Next week, let's talk about the blueberries you just bought or whatever mm -hmm. um, and really work at, 
you know, in season, what's out there? What can we go pick? Can we be involved in, you know, in our, in gathering our own food? You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's farm share, right? Mm -hmm. Be part of a farm share. Those are big around here. Um, so it's just giving people that knowledge is power that they just don't get traditionally and they're not going to get from their doctor. It just doesn't happen in this world. Yeah. One thing I want to dig into that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't care if either of us get any backlash because I think it's a really important issue is the rising obesity in this country, both adults, children, all of it. And, uh, you know, I think it, it was almost like I don't know which, which terminology would be better, epidemic or pandemic, but it was almost like the epidemic within the covid pandemic because you notice that, uh, you know, it's plain as day that there's a direct correlation between the health of your body and how your immune system is going to respond. And uh, it's unfortunate that even in the, the situation we existed within uh, COVID times and the pandemic is people kind of still refuse to address dietary issues and, and lack of exercise. And, uh, you know, there's also this big, it kind of ties into culture as well, this defense mechanism, right, with, you know, fat phobia, and we don't want to be attacking these people, demonizing um, anybody who's overweight and, and ignoring the uh, obstacles they might face and, and, and the individual situations, but at the same time, ignoring the issue as a whole um, has a whole, you know, catalog of, of issues, right? So what are your thoughts on, you know, how... How much of chronic pain is associated with obesity, with these uh, factors that are, are honestly within our control? Yeah, you know, no, you know, whether it's attractive or not, the eyes and the, the beholder, right? That's that's the other. It's a different thing. The fact is, if you're overweight, if you're fat, if you have belly fat, it is unhealthy. Period. The end. Don't let anybody yeah. kid you. Okay, being attractive is not the same as being unhealthy. I mm -hmm. briefly. You know, this is like a fire hose, I know, and I try to talk slow. My mom listens to this podcast, and she's, always, she's <laughs> always like, Jeff, you're talking too fast. But remember I talked before about interleukin-6 in belly fat, a yeah. pro-inflammatory cytokine. 82% of people, there was one study showed, that died in COVID early on, especially, were obese. Mm -hmm. And that was because they had a cytokine storm from that increased elevation of interleukin-6. So it's not a healthy thing for your immune system mm -hmm. to have excess body fat. Now, you can walk around at 20, 23, 24%. We have people in this country walking around at 50% yeah. or a bunch of them, 30%, yeah. right? I mean, they're, they, they, they have like three feet of fat around their middle yeah. and they're in denial. And it's really sad that society now is, is, um, is it's I'm not shaming anybody. I'm just yeah. stating scientific facts. Well, I think that, the concern the concern is that we're putting feelings over facts, and that might be okay in the short term, but in the long term, these people are going to face chronic pain, illness, and possibly death. So it's a serious issue that shouldn't be taken lightly. You know, you're right on. Now, I, what I say to people is, how many 300 pound people do you see over the age of 70? Yeah. How many? None. Zero. You don't see it. They don't make it through their 60s, and their 60s are horrible. Yeah. With Quality stomach stapling, it's horrible. Yeah. So once what you do in your 40s affects your 50s, what you've done in your 50s, if you haven't treated your body well in your 60s, you're going to be on four, five, six meds. You're going to be mm -hmm. a train wreck, and you're going to be dead early 70s. Yeah. And life is not – life is short, man. And I want to – I had a guy call me the other day. He goes, you want to go climb a mountain with snowshoes in Vermont? We got three feet of snow, and I was able to go – Yes, boom, I went and did it and yeah. had no problem because I stay in shape. Yeah, well, well you're one of the rare medical, I say rare, it's not like I know a million medical practitioners, but a lot of times, you know, you talk to a doctor and he's asking you about creatine as if it's a steroid or he's concerned because you're <laughs> lifting six days a week, right? But then there are doctors like you and there's a growing amount of them that, you know, practice what they preach and that are very active. And I think that is the key and maybe you can touch on a few other keys that, you know, you've experienced yourself and with patients. So, you know, of longevity, of extending quality of life, because we have a lot of these medical procedures or, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical options. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that are within our, ourselves, right? You know, getting exercise every day, choosing the right foods, getting the right sleep. All these things are within ourselves. They, they're, you know, they're essentially free. And uh, they do wonders over decades because we can be 60, 70, even 80 years old and go run a half marathon or go, you know, do these different things. A lot of the ultras that I'll, I'll run, there's some 70 year old or 80 year old that's doing it as well. And it's like, you know, wow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, you know, it's, it's, I think it's about not being obsessive, right? 
Mm -hmm. Um, I eat pizza. Sometimes I'll go out. I'll have a few glasses of wine. It's just personally Monday through Thursday, Monday through, I would say Monday through Thursday. I'm very much aware not to eat bread products, pasta, sugars. Um, You know, I I avoid that. I don't put any sugar in my coffee. On the weekends, though, I have fun. It's a balance, And it is a balance. So I think, um, you know, what I would tell people is that you definitely have to do resistance training. Keeping yes. muscle on is really, really important for your metabolism. Uh, that's why men typically have more muscle. They lose weight way faster than women. Uh, yeah. Women have a lot of times in our office, they just don't work out. So you need mm-hmm. to do that. Combine with, with aerobic work um, and maybe do some high-intensity interval training in there too where you're mm-hmm. getting your heart rate up you know, above 130, 40, 50. And combining those three things, however you want to do it. I paddleboard, I mountain bike, I run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I go to, I don't go to classes like CrossFit. So, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, one last question I'll ask for you personally is that you touched on that Masoji, but what are some, I guess, big challenges that you might have in your mind that are coming that could be physical or it could be something else? Uh, or, or, or have you interest, have you had any interest in ultra running? Cause you have experience running obviously with Ironman triathlons, <laughs> but, uh, what, what would it take to get you into that? At this point, um, I don't know. So here's what happens. I've done six. Maybe there's a lot of ultra runners listening. I've yeah. done six um, six marathons in my life, right? Yeah. I'm more of a cyclist. Um, I qualified for Boston, did that a little over three hours. So at that point, I was in that endurance world. And, you know, people doing 50Ks. I had to do the math. What's 50K? That's 31 miles, right? right. Um, okay, I, I, no. Um, <laughs> and then I hear, I hear yeah. stories about, you know, the 100 miles. Um, I, I think that when you get to be my age, if you haven't been doing it, it puts an incredible load yeah, um, on sense. what is what's now a bilaterally asymmetric body. I have damage, mm-hmm. all right, and I haven't my feet, my ankles, everything hasn't got to to this point um, to beat it into the ground with those types of miles. I don't yeah. think I could handle it. Well, I, I always talk about this that you know the funny truth is a lot of what you do, what I do with exercise is unnecessary, of course, but then also. It's uh, kind of like it's not only diminishing returns, but it's probably costing us in some ways in longevity. For example, like extreme weight training, right? Like if I'm powerlifting, okay, tons of benefits, right, for resistance training, for building up bone strength and bone health, blah, blah, blah. But then there's the, okay, well, let's keep going and push for like a 600-pound deadlift and go to the extreme. And that's when you run into some different injuries and so forth. And the same thing could be said for running where, you know, there's a right amount of running where yeah, you get a lot of the cardiovascular benefits, but then you go to the extreme, which is fun in the short term, but not something you can do, you know, forever without some kind of consequence. I'm sure the perfect plan would be, you know, stretch 20 minutes a week, do 20 to 30 minutes of resistance training twice a week, like these weird things that aren't as fulfilling. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's a it's a cost to benefit ratio. And li- like you mentioned, you know, starting to just do absurd volume and mileage at uh, 50, 60 years old, it's, it's stick to your cycling, reduce the, uh, the impact, <laughs> right. And, uh, and just go crazy with the bike. Yeah. Genetics play a huge role, right? Nature, nurture. Yeah, and, well. um, I think listening to your body and understanding mm-hmm. what's happening and, and having different exercises and different activities to circumvent, you know, yeah. maybe the, that part of your body that was beat up in yeah. that specific injury. Yeah, so kind of work around it. And, you know, I think the beauty too is just pivoting. It sounds like you've kind of had a mix. I mean, triathlons by definition are a mix of different, uh, you know, physical movements and, and sports in that way. But but in general, just in my experience with, you know, lifting with bodybuilding, but then doing ultra running, but then also kind of mixing in and getting a little bit more into a CrossFit-ish or just conditioning. It's it's fun. And, it, and I think it, it teaches you a lot of things. It humbles you as a beginner. You know, you have to start from scratch. You're not good at something that, that's new. And uh, it, there's, there's beauty in that. You know what? You're in your 20s. Have fun. Go nuts. Yeah. Beat yourself up. You have a ton of stem well cells in there that are they're going to heal. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and you'll see. Um, I think you'll be able to still rock it as long as you have that mindset. You just got to be a little bit smarter. I don't bomb yeah. downhill on my mountain bike like I used to. Yeah. I don't need to anymore. You know? Well, the good Things thing like is, I, I've been, fortunately, I've been smart enough that from like 14 years old when I started resistance training, I always warmed up. You know, I'd see. I, I used to work at this gym and I'd see this guy who was in his like early fifties and 
he'd walk over after doing like a mile run on like the treadmill, which helps a little bit, but he'd walk over to the bench press, immediately load up 225 on there and just start going like no warm up on the shoulders, no slow warm up, but he never got injured. Like that's just, he's done it for so long that it's just kind of worked out for him. But fortunately for me, even at young age, always doing a lot of warm up, warming up the shoulders, rotator cuffs, um, you know, same with like lower body stuff, hips, knees, everything like that. So luckily, um, I haven't been, uh, over using my youth if that makes sense um and hopefully that that pays off decades down the line we'll have to see yeah you know what works for you and yeah. uh yeah you know again learn from your mistakes right yeah. that's important that the law of wisdom right like i said before learn from your mistakes what did yeah. it teach you yeah so where can people find you well you know i think the best thing we're an hour north of boston we have people that fly in on jets all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you go to center for well f-o-r center f-o-r W-E-L-L dot com. Um, we do a lot of virtual programs. People call mm -hmm. from all over the country, and uh, especially the Metabolic Weight Loss Program. If you want to go there, you can you can search around, and there's all sorts of funky videos. And uh, mm -hmm. I think what we have put together, my wife Kelly, I make sure I mention her. She's she's the sharp one behind this. I'm just yeah. a talking head. So, That's yeah, right. we put together a good thing, I think. It kind of circles back to happy wife, happy life, right? We circle full credit. circle, Brock. Good job. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Hopefully, you guys got something out of today's podcast. Make sure you check out Jeff as well. Um, share the show if you enjoyed it. Subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.